Hi, welcome to Chemical Reactions. This is part of the middle unit of chemistry. I like to call the middle unit. <clears throat> it starts with nomenclature, where you learn the words when you're starting to learn the language of chemistry. <clears throat> Chapter 10, you're learning some of the concepts behind those words. And then here, you're actually learning sentences. You're learning how to write chemical reactions. So you're actually writing sentences. And those sentences will describe the behavior of the chemistry. So it's very important that you're able to predict products. If I give you two reactants, this is what this chapter is about. If I give you two reactants, you have to be able to write a complete balanced formula equation. In other words, if I give you, if I give you sodium iodide and I give you lead to nitrate, you have to put your head together and say, okay, based on what I learned in chapter on chemical reactions, it's going to be NaI plus Pb NO3, 2, yields NaNO3 plus PBI2, which is insoluble and will form a precipitate in the water. Then you balance the equation. A balanced chemical formula equation is called a stoichiometric equation. Now, chapter 12 is called, essentially, stoichiometry. You will study stoichiometry in chapter 12. So in chapter 9, you learn the words. In chapter 10, you learn the concepts behind those words. Chapter 11, you learn the sentences and even broader concepts, some of the grammar as well. And then in chapter 12, you actually write a story. So it's a very, very important four units. It's the middle units in the course. And it's the middle chapters in the course, the middle unit. And we're about halfway through. Now remember, we're doing all of the chapters at once, so some of this will be familiar to you, but we test each chapter individually. Okay? So let's begin. Make sure you take this in parts. It's a long video. Don't do it all in one sitting. You know, have a piece of scrap paper with you and try to predict what I'm going to say because I actually go over problems in this. So it's very thorough. Good luck. Have a good day. And goodbye. On May 6, 1937, the huge airship Hindenburg was heading for its landing site in Lakehurst, New Jersey after an uneventful transatlantic crossing. Suddenly, to the horror of observers on the ground, the airship erupted into a fireball. Within a short time, 210,000 cubic meters of the airship's lifting gas, hydrogen, had been burned and the airship was destroyed. The chemical reaction that occurred can be described as hydrogen combines with oxygen to produce water. In this section, you will learn to present this chemical reaction by a chemical equation. Here are some pictures of the Hindenburg. There's a colorized picture in the upper left. That's at Lakehurst, New Jersey. It's actually not too very far from where I grew up. That's a shot of the interior looking down at the ground. And then that's an actual faded photograph from the actual event. Here's some more uh, pictures from the burning. It, uh, I believe it stopped at the Empire State Building, and, that, and that was a, there was a mooring mast there that people could get on and off at the Empire State Building. First person to give me some extra credit will get extra credit if you can tell me more about the mooring mast at the Empire State Building. Uh, which was uh, one of the tallest buildings in the world. What, not for very long, but it certainly uh, was very tall for its time. 
There's a hundred and some stories. Uh, maybe not quite that. Maybe it was it was tall. And here's a uh, here's the naval air station. You see the the uh, navy the navy sailors in navy dress waiting for the airship to come to the ground. Okay, let's begin again. Every minute of every day, chemical reactions take place, both inside you and around you. Isn't that exciting, guys? Okay, I'm in class. Okay, not all are as dynamic as the explosion of the Hindenburg, but many are much more, much more complex. After a meal, a series of chemical reactions take place as your body digests food. Uh, they're run by something called enzymes, which are giant proteins. Similarly, plants use sunlight to drive the photosynthetic processes needed to produce plant growth. Although the chemical reactions involved in photosynthesis and digestion are different, both chemical reactions are necessary to sustain life. In a chemical reaction, one or more reactants change into one or more products. Enzymes actually control uh, re metabolic reactions, otherwise they would occur too quickly and be useless to our metabolic needs. Figure one on the next page shows the, the ingredients for making leavened bread, flour, yeast, salt, and water. Chemical reactions take place when the ingredients are mixed together and heated in the oven. Figure 1b shows the product, a loaf of bread. Chemists use a chemical equation, a quick shorthand notation, to convey as much information as possible about what happens in a chemical reaction. Word equations. How do you describe what happens in a chemical reaction? Recall from chapter 2 the shorthand method for writing a description of a chemical reaction. That was simply was, if you recall, reactants yields products. Figure 1, chemical changes occur when bread dough is mixed and baked. Flour, salt, yeast, and water are the ingredients for making leavened bread. B, the reactants in the ingredients undergo chemical changes to form the product, baked bread. What evidence shows that chemical uh, changes have occurred. Well, if you recall from reading chapter 2 and, and lab work, etc., that we either have done or will do, the color change in the bread is going to be indicative, indicative of a chemical reaction. The fact that the bread rose, you have chemical reactions occurring where carbon dioxide is given off, and some of those reactants are not too terribly dissimilar relative to what happens in the human body or can happen in the human body. And here is here are the here are the ingredients. The girl on the left, bottom left, she's she has the ingredients on the table. I'll show you more ingredients in a moment. B is the bread. Uh, the upper the upper part, uh, the upper left is a bread factory. Uh, I grew up on white bread. We thought it was wonderful. Little did I know that it was pretty uh, non-nutritious and pretty worthless to you. Here's a giant factory where the bread, those are the ovens where the bed, the bed, the bread is baked and then uh, sorted in the table in front of it. And you can see that bread is very large and it, it takes uh, an enormous facility to bake the bread because you have to bake large quantities because it's really one loaf for three or four people or for only for a week maybe in a household so they've got to make a lot of bread and you need a lot of space. The industrial baking process, bread has been baked for hundreds of years and the same basic process is still used by the baking industry today. The process, not the engineering. The main ingredients are flour, yeast to make the bread rise. That's why when I talk about a metabolic reaction, uh, the yeast is uh, something that can be found in the body, uh, but it uses a biological, biochemical reaction to produce materials that are used, the products are used to help the bread rise. You have salt, vinegar as a preservative, that's acetic acid vinegar. You have vegetable fat, margarine butter, oil to make the loaf lighter and airier 
an extended shelf life, and water to complete the, the mix. Writing chemical equations. In this, in, in this method, the reactants are written on the left and the products on the right. An arrow separated them. You read the arrow as yields, gives, or reacts to produce. Reactants yields products. That's the way I've always read it. How could you describe the rusting of iron shown in figure 2b? You could say iron reacts with oxygen to produce iron 3 oxide or rust. That's a perfectly good description, and I agree. But it might be quicker and easier to identify the reactants and products by means of a word equation. And you could actually make it even simpler by put, putting down the the uh, formulas for those words, as we will see later on. Three <coughs> common chemical reactions are shown. A, when methane gas burns, it combines with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. B, iron turns to red-brown rust, iron-3 oxide. That's plus three oxidation state in the process of oxygen in the air. Hydrogen peroxide, many, many dentists use it, people use it to clean your teeth, people use it on wounds. Uh, hydrogen peroxide decomposes to water and oxygen when used as an antiseptic. So it's also used as an antiseptic. Uh, enormous facilities for the production of hydrogen peroxide, a very common chemical used in industry, and it's made by the millions of gallons. Rust is an iron oxide, usually red oxide, formed by the redox reaction of iron and oxygen in the presence of water or air mixture. I'll explain what redox is in a moment. Several forms of rust are distinguishable both virtually and by spectroscopy and form under different circumstances. Rust consists of hydrated iron-3 oxides Fe2O3 dot N is the number of moles, we'll talk about that later, H2O, and iron-3 oxide hydroxide, uh, FeOH with a 3. Given sufficient time, oxygen and water, iron, uh, any iron mass will eventually convert entirely to rust and disintegrate. Surface rust is flaky and friable. What's that word mean, friable? Friable is when something flakes, like rust. You've seen rust, and it's kind of flaky. And it will eventually disintegrate. That's friable. And provides no protection to the underlying iron. Unlike the formation of patina on copper surfaces, such as the Statue of Liberty, for instance, or a brass bell. Rusting is a common term for corrosion of iron and its alloys, such as steel. Many other metals undergo equivalent corrosion, but the resulting oxides are not commonly called rust. Other forms of rust exist, like the result of the reaction between iron and chloride in an environment deprived of oxygen. Rebar, used in underwater concrete pillars or pilings is an example which generates green rust. Here you have a ship and an old Volkswagen bug which are rusting. That's B. Uh, also interesting is that there are microorganisms that digest rust. For instance, in, I don't know, hundreds of years, the Titanic will no longer exist. Maybe a shadow of its former self will stay as a in the bottom of the ocean, but the Titanic is currently being dissolved by microorganisms that digest iron, and it will, as a result, weaken and then disappear. The word, to write a word equation such as above, iron plus oxygen yields iron 3 oxide. To write a word equation, write the names of the reactants to the left of the arrow separated by a plus sign. Write the names of the products to the right of the arrow. 
also separated by a plus sign. Notice that no plus sign is needed on the product side of this equation because iron 3 oxide is the only product. Now we're on to the next one. Have you ever poured the antiseptic hydrogen peroxide on an open cut? Bubbles of oxygen form rapidly as the plot thickens. Those, that white foam is actually oxygen being formed. As shown in figure 2C, the production of a new substance, a gas, is evidence of a chemical change. Here's, uh, here's C, the hydrogen peroxide. Pulp and paper industry uses 50% of all the peroxide used. Manufacturing of sodium perborate and, um, and sodium uh, percarbonate, detergents and bleaches, uh, textiles, water purification, so it has a lot, a lot of usage. The dental industry, somebody's brushing his teeth with some peroxide in it. There's the bubbles in lower right. Here's a bird. I had to look twice to see what this, this, this is actually a bird. The kingfisher is able to feed in a previously polluted river which has been cleaned up by treating it with a solution of hydrogen peroxide. Danger, danger. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And there is the, the, the ball and stick model of it, where the red is the oxygen and the H is the hydrogen. The space shuttle does not use... The space shuttle does not use hydrogen peroxide, but it looked like a kind of a cool picture. Because uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about it. I wanted an excuse to do it early. Uh, the space shuttle, if you look back, if you see, look at the space shuttle, you see those external fuel tanks. There were actually three types of external fuel tanks. The standard fuel tank was 7,700 pounds. That was enormous. One fuel tank was, was loaded with liquid hydrogen. And the other one was loaded with liquid oxygen, weighing enormous amounts of, having enormous amounts of uh, mass. And then they would be used up and disposed of. They'd fall in the ocean, retrieved and recycled, used again. Well, get, get this. The standard fuel tank was 7,700 pounds, and it was a copper-aluminum alloy and it was 7,700 pounds. You can imagine the amount of thrust that you needed for that thing. And then they made the lightweight tank. And that was also copper and aluminum, but it got rid of like a lot of fiddly bits, you know, like wiring and gauges and external things that weren't needed. And that was 6,600 pounds. So they got rid of 1,000 pounds of things from that. And then they made the super lightweight tank. Now, this is what's fascinating. And that was also filled with hydrogen and oxygen, liquid hydrogen and oxygen. And that was made of aluminum and lithium. Now, are you ready for the densities? Aluminum has a density of 2.8, and lith lithium has a, has a density of 0.535. All densities are given in grams per cubic centimeter. Copper, which was the standard weight tank and the lightweight tank, is 8.92. So copper is what? 17 times more dense than, than lithium. Lithium is less dense than, than some wood. Wood is, is between 0 and 1. It's about, you know, oak is like 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And why did they need to do this with the same volume of tank? Well, not to reduce the volume, but to increase the payload on the, on the shuttle to make the mission more profitable. But why am I doing this now, you might ask? Okay, well, the reason is because, the reason is because hydrogen plus oxygen yields water, an explosive, simple chemical reaction. A view of the Montafut petrochemical complex on the Gulf of Thailand, close to the border with Cambodia. A plant to produce hydrogen peroxide has recently been commissioned in the complex. It is capable of producing 330,000 tons of hydrogen peroxide a year, 
the largest such plant in the world. This photograph shows distillation towers used for the separation of alkalines from natural gas. The hydrogen needed to make hydrogen peroxide is derived from the methane in natural gas. Hydrogen peroxide solution is being unloaded, having traveled from where it was made. It is being used to make hydrazine. Hydrazine is used as the propellant in most satellites and as a precursor for sodium azide, a gas-forming agent in airbags, and for a variety of pesticides. Hydrogen peroxide is not just something you put in a medicine cabinet. Bubbles of oxygen gas form rapidly as shown in figure 2C. The production of a new substance, a gas, is evidence of a chemical change. Two new substances are produced in this reaction, oxygen gas and liquid water. You could describe this reaction by saying hydrogen peroxide decomposes to form water and oxygen gas. You could also write a word equation. Hydrogen peroxide yields water plus oxygen. So those bubbles are the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to form oxygen. What's left over? Just plain everyday H2O. When you light a burner on your stove, methane gas bursts into flames and produces the energy needed to heat your soup. Methane is the major component of natural gas, a common fuel for heating homes and cooking food. The burning of methane, it also has ethane in it, as shown in figure 2a, is a chemical reaction. How would you write the word equation for this reaction? Burning a substance typically requires oxygen. So methane and oxygen are the reactants. The products are water and carbon dioxide. Thus, the word equation is methane plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water, providing it's a blue flame. The blue flame is the clean flame. So in the next picture, you'll see a typical methane flame on the stove, and that's going to be blue. So when it combines with the oxygen in your kitchen, and you mix it with the methane and ethane coming out of the tap, so to speak, you produce a blue flame. If it's not blue, then it's not being burned completely, and you are producing things other than, or in addition to, carbon dioxide and water, and there are the molecules. Now, methane hydrates melt at room temperature, releasing the ignitable gas inside. Uh, a lot of these were discovered in the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of the United States, and it, it forms deep in the water where you have, uh, it's very cold, and you have a tremendous amount of pressure. And we'll see why substances can change given those particular kinds of conditions. A section of the Arctic Ocean seafloor that holds vast stores of frozen methane is, show, is showing signs of instability and widespread venting of the powerful greenhouse gas. That greenhouse gas, do you know methane is 25 times-ish, 25 times more, more potent as a greenhouse gas than is carbon dioxide? Uh, where was I? Let's start over. A section of the Arctic Ocean seafloor that holds vast stores of frozen methane is showing signs of instability and widespread venting of the powerful greenhouse gas, according to the findings of an international research team led by University of Alaska Fairbanks scientist Natalia Shokova and Igor let me think about how that is. Plus, I have to change the timings. Hold on. I'll be right back. You'll never know I was gone. All right. Let's try that again. Igor Semilotov or Igor Semilotov. Okay. Sounds better. The result, the research results published in the March 5th edition 
of the journal Science, that's just the name of the magazine, Science, show that the permafrost under the East Siberian Arctic Shelf thought, long thought to be an impenetrable barrier sealing in methane is perforated and is starting to leak large amounts of methane into the atmosphere. That's not good. This is from 2010, so I would imagine that, that the year was 2010 that it was made, this uh, particular, that it was written, this particular article. Release of even a fraction of the, of the methane stored in the shelf could trigger abrupt climate warming. The amount of methane currently coming out of the East Siberian Arctic Shelf is comparable to the amount coming out of the entire world's ocean, says Shakova, a researcher at UAF's International Arctic Research Center. Quote, subsea permafrost is losing its ability to be an impermeable cap, unquote. Methane is a greenhouse gas more than 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It is released from previously frozen soils in two ways. So it's more than 25. I thought it was around 25, 30. Uh, I think 30 is a little too high, but who knows? It could be the hydrated form of it. When the organic material, which contains carbon, stored in permafrost thaws, it begins to decompose and under anaerobic conditions gradually releases, releases methane. Methane can also be stored in the seabed as methane gas or methane hydrates and then release as subsea permafrost thaws. These releases can be larger and more abrupt than those that result from decomposition. The East Siberian Arctic Shelf is a methane-rich area that encompasses more than 2 million square kilometers of seafloor in the Arctic Ocean. It is more than three times as large as the nearby Siberian wetlands which have been considered the primary northern hemisphere's source of atmospheric methane. Shokova's research results show that the East Siberian Arctic Shelf is already, significant, is, is already a significant methane source, releasing 7 teragrams of methane yearly, which is as much as is emitted from the rest of the ocean. A teragram is equal to about 1.1 million tons. Terra is the prefix trillion, 10 to the 12th. Uh, mega is 10 to the 6th. Giga is 10 to the 9th. And Terra is 10 to the 12th. Our concern is that the subsea permafrost has been showing signs of destabilization already, she said. If it further destabilizes, the methane emissions may not be teragrams, it would be significantly larger. Shakova's, Shakova notes that the Earth's geological record indicates that atmospheric methane concentrations have varied between 0.3 to 0.4 parts per million during cold periods and 0.6 to 0.7 parts per million during warm periods. Current average methane concentration in the Arctic average about 1.85 parts per million, the highest in 400,000 years, she said. Gives credibility to the uh, global warming. Concentrations above the East Siberian Arctic Shelf are even higher. The East Siberian Arctic Shelf is a relative frontier in methane studies. The shelf is shallow, 50 meters, 164 feet, or less in depth, which means it has been alternately submerged or terrestrial, depending on sea levels throughout Earth's history. During the, during the Earth's coldest periods, it is a frozen Arctic coastal plain and does not release methane. As the earth warms and sea level rises, it is inundated with seawater, which is 12 to 15 degrees warmer than average air temperature. And the problem is only getting worse. 
by the way. Uh, it, was, it was thought that seawater kept the East Siberian Arctic shelf perm permafrost frozen, Shakova said. Nobody considered this huge area. This study is a testament to sustained, careful observations and to international cooperation in research, said Henrietta Edmonds of the National Science Foundation, which partially funded the study. The Arctic is a different place to get to and to work in, but it is important that we do so in order to understand its role in global climate and its response and contribution to ongoing environmental change. Now remember, this is all about methane. It is important to understand the size of the reservoir, the amount of trapped methane that potentially could be released, as well as the process that have kept has the process that have kept it trapped and those that control the release. Work like this helps us to understand and document these processes. Earlier studies, earlier studies in Siberia focused on methane escaping from thawing terrestrial permafrost. Semilatov's work during the 1990s showed among other things, that the amount of methane being emitted from terrestrial sources decreased at higher latitudes, but those studies stopped at the coast. Starting in the fall of 2003, Shakova, Semilatov, and the rest of their team took the studies offshore. From 2003 through 2008, they took annual research cruises throughout the shelf and sampled seawater at various depths and the air 10 meters above the ocean. In, 2000, in September 2006, they flew a helicopter over the same area, taking air samples at up to 2,000 meters or 6,562 feet in the atmosphere. In April 2007, they conducted a winter ex expedition on the sea ice. This is 2007. They found that more than 80% of the deep water and more than 50% of surface water had methane levels more than eight times that of normal seawater. In some areas, the saturation levels reached more than 250 times that of background levels in the summer and 1,400 times higher in the winter. They found corresponding results in the air directly above the Arctic surface. Methane levels were elevated overall and the seascape was dotted with more than 100 hotspots. Remember when you heat water, you can dissolve more sugar and salt. You can dissolve more of a solid. But when you heat water, you can dissolve less gas. So gas is more soluble in cold water than hot water. So when it says the saturation levels uh, reached more than 250 times that of the background levels in the summer and 14 times higher in the winter, you, the winter, the colder water will dissolve more gas. This combined with winter expedition results that found methane gas trapped under and in the sea ice showed the team that the methane was not only being dissolved in the water, it was bubbling out into the atmosphere. These findings were further confirmed when Chakova and her colleagues sampled methane levels at higher elevations. Methane levels throughout the Arctic are usually 8 to 10 percent higher than the global baseline. When they flew over the shelf, they found methane at levels another 5 to 10 percent higher than the already elevated Arctic levels. 
the release to the atmosphere of only 1% of the methane assumed to be stored in shallow hydrate deposits might alter the current atmospheric burden of methane up to three to four times. Shukova said the climactic consequences of this are hard to predict. Shukova, Semilitov, and collaborators from 12 institutions in five countries plan to continue their studies in this region, tracking the source of the methane emissions and drilling into the seafloor in an effort to estimate how much methane is stored there. Okay, let's look at some of these um, statistics on this slide. It says, up top, it says, warning threat to the frozen ground of the Arctic. Areas of continuous permafrost, that's in the dark blue. You can see that it's northern Canada, uh, around Greenland, and most of Russia. Gosh, it goes actually quite a bit south uh, into what you would think of the more temperate areas such as Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, etc. And then it says 2200, year when two-thirds of the existing permafrost will have disappeared. 30,000 years, period when much of the Arctic's organic material was locked away in frozen permafrost. And then it says there's a, a little kind of, uh, looks like it has permafrost as a red arrow, active layer deepens, uh, active uh, year by year or something of that nature, vegetation. And then it shows that that permafrost, there's arrows coming into the right, and it says permafrost, carbon thaws, and decays, and it becomes atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, how permafrost carbon feedback works, surface temperature increases, and then it says 190 billion tons amount of carbon that will be released by melting permafrost. So it's pretty intense. Uh, we've got a, a lot of work to do to literally save the planet. It's a very complex, very complex issue. It says on the right, it says the permafrost of the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, an area of about 2 million kilometers squared, is more porous than previously thought. The ocean on top of it and the heat from the mantle below it, warm it and make it perforated like Swiss cheese. Quick facts. Methane. Methane is a carbon molecule 86 to 100 times more potent as a global warming, heat-trapping gas than carbon dioxide over a 20-year time horizon. It remains in the atmosphere for about 12 years over which time its heating impact is 100 times that of carbon dioxide and only disappears as it is converted to other greenhouse gases, GHGs, the most notable carbon dioxide. I thought it said earlier that it was 24 times or, 20, or 30 times more deadly than more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So I'm not quite sure what they're talking about there. You might want to do a little research, a little more background information. But it, either way, it's, uh, it's a significantly different gas than carbon dioxide, much more harmful. It says, on our present course and based on conservative estimates, an irreversible carbon tipping point will occur within 20 years between 2020 and 2030. This could result in the release of at least 100 billion tons, that's a lot, of carbon by 2100 and two-thirds of stored deposits by 2200. No climate models to date incorporate consideration 
of the various amplifying and inter-reinforcing Arctic feedbacks, loss of sea ice, albedo, warming, uh, northern peatlands. Peat is a is a precursor to coal, you know, millions of years away, but peat is something they use as a fuel uh, in uh, northern latitudes. They used to use it a lot more than they do now, but peat is kind of like, um, it's a material that uh, is a, I guess, precursor to coal. Uh, it's a hard, tough, uh, grassy material that's buried and you can use it in a fireplace and it uh, you have peat fires very my ancestors in Ireland uh, used them right well into the 20th century let me start that over that slide it says no climate models to date incorporate consideration of the various amplifying and inter-reinforcing Arctic feedbacks Loss of sea ice, albedo, warming, uh, northern peatlands, methane release from permafrost melt, methane uh, clathrates uh, from the melt of the ocean floor, nitrous oxide feedback, soot, nor do they evaluate their combined impacts. So... Many of the climate models that exist are literally outdated by some of the research that has gone on in the last three or four years. So they, the, the amount of data being generated is simply way outstretching the ability of us to keep up with it relative to the relative to the formation of climate models that will help us predict outcomes for the next 100 years or more. Release of even a fraction of the methane stored in the shelf could trigger abrupt climate warning. In the Earth's history, sudden flips to a different, unstable global climate state of plus two to plus four degrees Celsius have occurred over as brief as a three-year period of time, and the known records are plus six over one to three years and plus 10 to 12 over 50 years. That's Stephenson, 2008, and that's from the National Science Foundation press release, March 2010. So we could literally have a catastrophic event occurring and it would only take one to three years for it to uh, happen, not a geological time frame. Carbon dioxide emissions are cumulative, which is bad because even if we could reduce them to zero this minute, inertia from the 30 to 40 year lag between the release of heat trapping gases and the lifetime of a major portion of CO2 emissions, the primary source of inertia based on time it takes for that energy to force itself into the climate system, 90% oceans would continue to warm the planet. Global average temperatures would still rise for decades and any reduction from a future peak if a runaway tip was somehow avoided would take would take hundreds would take hundreds of years even if we act now it's uh, not good international climate negotiations can't even find agreement on inadequate emission reduction targets based on flawed climate models. Watch this short video and dangerous outdated science, another short video that doesn't include feedback loops, the main driver of the climate crisis, let alone the catastrophic threat of the Arctic feedbacks outlined above which
based on current negotiation parameters are still not even under consideration. All right, this is uh, produced by the NSF, that's the National Science Foundation in the United States. You can see the area they're talking about, the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, 2 million square kilometers. Similar amount of methane generated here as from the rest of the world's ocean. If you added all the rest of the world's ocean, it would equal that amount. Unbelievable. And then, so, it says here, methane bursting into the atmosphere, water point, negative 0.5 degrees Celsius to negative 1.3, permafrost uh, perforated due to warm temperatures on both, uh, both sides, methane stores, uh, lithosphere with hot mantle. A uh, little bit uh, would certainly certainly be of concern. Let's continue. Here they are in the ship. It's a picture of the ship, and uh, it's a measuring some kind of instrumentation. So that's the Arctic Ocean, very uh, forbidden looking. Okay, we're back to writing chemical equations. Checkpoint. Uh, what does the arrow in a word equation mean? It means yields. Chemical equations. Word equations adequately describe chemical reactions, but they are cumbersome. It's easier to use the formulas for the reactants and products to write chemical equations. A chemical equation is a representation of a chemical reaction. The formulas of the reactants on the left are connected by an arrow with the formulas of the products on the right. The formulas of the reactants, arrow to the right, the formulas of the products. You read it left to right. Here is a chemical equation for rusting. Iron plus oxygen, Fe, plus O2, yields Fe2O3. Rust is iron 3. Equations that show just the formulas of reactants and products are called skeleton equations. It's not balanced. A skeleton equation is a chemical equation that does not indicate the relative amounts of the reactants and products. The first step in writing a complete chemical equation is to write the skeleton equation. It is not a balanced equation. The skeleton equation is a rough sketch of the actual final balanced formula equation. Write the formulas of the reactants to the left of the yield sign, arrow is the yield sign, and the formulas of the products to the right. To add more information to the equation, you can indicate the physical states of substances by putting a symbol after each formula. Use S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, AQ for a substance in aqueous solution, a substance dissolved in water. AQ is aqueous, G is gas, L is liquid, S is solid. Here is the equation for rusting with symbols for the physical states added. Fe, then it's S is solid, oxygen is gas, and the iron 3 oxide is a solid. In many chemical reactions, a catalyst is added to the reaction mixture. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up the reaction but is not used up in the reaction. That's a catalyst. The catalyst is put above the arrow, usually. For example, figure 3 shows the co uh, compound manganese 4 oxide, or manganese dioxide is the old way of saying it, MnO2, it's a solid, it's a black solid, gray-black solid, catalyzes the decomposition 
of an aqueous solution of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, uh, to produce water and oxygen. That's 2H2O2 aqueous yields 2H2O liquid plus O2 gas. Many of the symbols commonly used in writing chemical equations are listed in Table 1. That's going to be the next slide. We also have to look at Figure 3 as well. So, Table 1, here's the symbols, plus sign, yields. Uh, this is like a reversible reaction for equilibria. Solid liquids, gas, aqueous, heat. Triangle is heat. PT is platinum. That's also where you put the catalyst. You put it above the arrow, like platinum is a catalyst. For instance, in catalytic converters, the platinum helps to catalyze the conversion of the noxious fumes before they're released. Uh, figure 3, hydrogen peroxide decomposes to form water and oxygen gas. Bubbles of oxygen appear slowly as decomposition proceeds. B, with the addition of the catalyst manganese 4 oxide, MnO2, decomposition speeds up. The white smoke is condensed water vapor. It's like steam. So here is the, you put the catalyst above the arrow. I have it here, I have it inside the arrow, and that's the reaction. Down below is the more of the molecular size, uh, more, uh, it's a little bit more instructive as to what's happening. Uh, you can see the steam being given off. The uh, steam is actually, steam that you can see, people think of steam, it's actually condensed water vapor. Here is a molecular model of the geometry that is involved in the hydrogen peroxide molecule. Uh, peroxide is actually a polyatomic ion. It's a negative 2 polyatomic ion. So it's O2 with a negative 2 charge. So peroxide, O2 is oxygen, molecular oxygen, but it can also be O2 with a negative 2 charge. This is uh, something that I'll do. This is a uh, elephant toothpaste experiment, and uh, I can do that. Uh, I'm going to do that in class, and it uses hydrogen peroxide uh, as a uh, means to an end in doing the demonstration for elephant toothpaste. Uh, very easy demonstration to do. Now, uh, this is uh, more derived, recently evolved groups of the beetles store high quantities of hydrogen peroxide in their body, allowing them to have explosive uh, ejection. So the beetle can spray uh, out some orifice or another uh, hydrogen peroxide fumes, some gas. Uh, so it's a, an evolution of sorts. Uh, problem sample one, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydrogen carbonate are shown before being placed uh, in the beaker to react. The products formed are aqueous sodium chloride water and carbon dioxide gas. Write a skeleton equation for this chemical reaction. So the next slide is going to uh, analyze before I actually write the equation. And it says uh, write the correct formula for each substance in the reaction. In other words, you're going to look at the nomenclature. You're going to make sure everything's writ written correctly. Separate the reactants, then separate the nomenclature uh, from the products by the arrow and indicate the state of each substance, liquid, solid, gas, aqueous, etc. Now the next slide is going to list, uh, it, it lists what the different things are, what sodium, hy sodium hydrogen carbonate looks like, that's NaHCO3, it's a solid, hydrochloric acid, etc. Then you put everything into the equation down below, and as it's written, as it is seen, 
it is indeed balanced. It is indeed balanced. So everything is done. Problem set. So how would you write the word equation for the manufacture of bicycles? Simply simplify your task by limiting yourself to four major components. Frames, wheels, handlebars, and pedals. Your word equation for making a bicycle could read, could read, frame plus wheel plus handlebars plus pedal yields bicycle. That is going to be the product, the bicycle. Your word equation shows your word equation shows the reactants, the kind of parts, and the products of bicycle. But if you were responsible for ordering parts to make the bicycle, this word equation would be inadequate because it would not indicate the quantity of each part needed to make one bicycle. A standard bicycle is composed of one frame, two wheels, one handlebar, and two pedals. Using the, using the symbols, the formula for a bicycle would be FW sub 2, subscript 2, HP2. The skeleton equation for bicycle assembly would be F plus W plus H plus P yields FW2 HP2. This is an unbalanced equation. An unbalanced equation does not indicate the quantity of the reactants needed to make the product. A complete description of the reaction must include not only the kinds of parts involved, but also the quantities of parts required. Let me read that again. A complete description of the reaction must include not only the kinds of parts involved, but also the quantity of parts required. So here is more of a uh, picture, pictorial, balancing the chemical equation. This is balanced. This is the a balanced chemo, a balanced equation for making a bicycle. It tells you that one frame, two wheels, one handlebar, two pedals produce one bicycle. To balance the equation, the number two was placed before wheels and pedals. The number one is understood to be in front of frame, handlebar, and bicycle and bicycle. These numbers are called coefficients, small whole numbers that are placed in front of the formulas in an equation in order to balance it. In this balanced equation, the number of each bicycle part on the reactant side is the same as the number of those parts on the product side. So products and they're got to be equal. Make conservation of mass. A chemical, a chemical reaction that is described by a balanced equation in which each side of the equation has the same number of atoms of each element and mass is conserved. Real bicycles are being assembled in figure four. Recall that John Dalton's atomic theory states that as reactants are converted to products, the bonds holding the atoms together are broken and new bonds are formed. The atoms themselves are neither created nor destroyed. They are merely rearranged. This part of Dalton's theory explains the law of conservation of mass in any chemical re change, in any chemical change, mass is always conserved. If a bicycle factory runs out of any part needed for a bicycle, production must stop. Production must stop. So things have to remain in stock in order for the industry to remain viable. So same thing with a chemical formula. If you're going to run out of one of the reagents, then you're going to stop making product. Here's a very old picture. Looks like uh, just after World War II. Uh, these guys are seriously posing for this picture. Uh, a bicycle factory. A bicycle factory. Circa, I'm guessing, 1947, maybe.
Here's probably that same factory, uh, just a different picture uh, in that factory. The next picture is interesting. Look at the uh, workforce, how it's changed, and look at the uh, location of it has probably changed as well. Balancing chemical equations. The atoms in the products are the same atoms that were in the reactants. They are just rearranged. Representing a chemical reaction by a balanced chemical equation is a two-step process. To write a balanced chemical equation, first write the skeleton equation, then use coefficients to balance the equation so that it obeys the law of conservation of mass. In every balanced equation, each side of the equation has the same number of atoms of each element. Sometimes a skeleton equation may already be balanced. That happens quite frequently, and you kind of scratch your head wondering if you did something right or wrong, but oftentimes that happens. Uh, for example, carbon burns in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. Well, carbon plus O2, C plus O2, yields CO2. Well, one carbon, one carbon, two oxygens, two oxygens. So that, the way that's written, the way that's written is a balanced chemical equation. This equation is balanced. One carbon atom and two oxygen atoms are on each side of the equation. You do not need to change the coefficients. They are all understood to be one. Checkpoint. What is the law of conservation of mass? What about the equation for the reaction of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas? What about the equation for the reaction of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas? This is the reaction that occurred in the Hindenburg disaster, which you read about in connecting to your world. H2 plus O2 yields H2O. 2H2 plus O2 yields 2H2O. And that's the reaction for the combination of hydrogen and oxygen as we see here. When hydrogen and oxygen are mixed, a spark will initiate a rapid reaction. The product of the reaction is water. This is the equation for the burning of hydrogen. H2 plus O2 yields H2O. Now, that's not balanced yet. That's not balanced. The formulas for all the reactants and products are correct, but this equation is not balanced. Count the atoms on both sides of the equation. Two oxygen atoms are on the reactant side of the equation, and only one oxygen atom is on the product, or the right side. As written, the equation does not obey the law of conservation of mass, and so it does not does not make any sense. What can you do? What can you do to balance it? A few guidelines for writing balanced equations will help. So what I'm going to talk about now are a list, literally a list. Uh, if you have a problem with balancing equations, you can you can refer to this list. I would take this down and put this in your notes. Okay. Rules for writing and balancing equations. One, determine the correct formulas for all the reactants and products. That's a lesson in nomenclature. Write the skeleton equation by placing the formulas for the reactants on the left and the formulas for the products on the right, and then put the yield sign between. If two or more reactants or products are involved, separate the formulas with plus signs. Three, Determine the number of atoms of each element in the reactants and the products. Count a polyatomic ion as a single unit if it appears unchanged on both sides of the equation. Don't separate it into individual atoms. You'll go out of your mind. Just if a polyatomic is phosphate's on the left and it's on the right, put one phosphate or whatever. Balance the phosphate individually. 
4. Balance the elements one at a time by using coefficients. When no coefficient is written, it is assumed to be 1. Begin by balancing elements that appear only once on each side of the equation. Never balance an equation by changing the subscripts in a chemical formula. Let me say that again. Never balance an equation by changing the subscripts in a chemical formula. Each substance has only one correct formula. Check each atom or polyatomic ion to be sure they are equal on both sides of the equation. Make sure all the coefficients are in the lowest possible ratio. Make sure that all coefficients are in the lowest possible ratio. Writing a chemical, a balanced chemical equation. Hydrogen and oxygen react to form water. The reaction releases enough energy to launch a rocket. Write a balanced equation for the reaction. And now it makes more sense to have the space shuttle because that is actually the fuel for the, especially the early part of the flight of the space shuttle. Apply the rules of balancing equations to the skeleton equation describing the reaction. So that's going to be the analysis. That's um, analyzing the situation before I actually solve it. Let's see what that does for me relative to this. Write correct formulas to give the skeleton equation. So H2 gas plus O2 gas yields H2O liquid. Count the number of each kind of atom. Hydrogen is balanced, but oxygen is not. If you put the coefficient 2 in front of H2O, the oxygen will be balanced. The oxygen is balanced. And there's that. However, now twice as much hydrogen atoms are in the product as are in the reactants. So what do I do? I need four hydrogens on the left. I need four hydrogens on the left. I have two. Can't change the two subscript. I can't make that a four. What, is, what do I have to do? You balance by using coefficients. So what coefficient am I going to use? The, to correct this, put the coefficient two in front of the H2. Four hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms are on each side of the chemical equation. The balanced, the equation is now balanced. So you have four hydrogens on the left, one, two, three, four, two H2. You have two oxygens, one O2. And then you have two H2Os, count up, one, two, three, four hydrogen, and two oxygen. So everything is balanced. Very simple reaction. You can tell a lot from the reaction of water. Okay, it says the reaction of copper metal with an aqueous solution of silver nitrate is described by the skeleton equation. How can it be balanced? Uh, copper plus AgNO3 yields CuNO3 with a 2 and then Ag. So how are you going to balance that? Well, I would balance the nitrates first. That's what I would balance. So you have to put a 2 in front of the AgNO3. That's just me. Call me crazy. The nitrate ion appears unchanged on both sides of the equation. So this ion can be balanced as a unit. Do this by placing a 2 in front of AgNO3. AgNO3. So it's going to be, so let's see, does that do it? Let's see. So now I got to put a two in front of the silver. All right. And I'm going to put a two in front of the silver. This equation is now balanced. So you only put two things in. That's easy. Because the same number of each kind of atom are at both sides of the uh, equation. Balancing a chemical equation. We're continuing with this. Aluminum is a good choice for outdoor furniture because it reacts with oxygen in the air to form a thin protective coat of aluminum oxide. Balance the equation for this reaction. 
Al plus O2 yields Al2O3. Now, I'm going to apply the rules for balancing the equation. Let's take it just a f just a few seconds and look at aluminum, some pictures of aluminum and some data. Here's some aluminum for f uh, lawn furniture. Uh, doesn't look particularly comfortable, but that's bauxite, and that's the mining of bauxite. Bauxite is the ore from which aluminum is extracted, and that's some bauxite ore, these little nuggets. Looks kind of a little bit like concrete. Uh, that's bauxite. About one, 110 million tons of aluminum was produced in 1994. Australia produces most of the world's aluminum. Diagram from ITAM, bauxite, by the Mineral Council of Australia. The leading producer of alumina is China with 40% of the world's total. So there are some uh, percentages, uh, pretty amazing stuff actually. Here's a little bit more durable uh, aluminum, a little thicker. I've seen uh, sets like this and uh, they last a bit longer. They're a little bit tougher. Uh, uh, first balance the aluminum by placing a coefficient 2 in front of the aluminum. How can the, how can the uh, odd number of oxygen atoms in the product on the right side balance the even number of oxygen atoms on the left? Any whole number coefficient placed in front of the O2 will give an even number of oxygen atoms on the left. This is because the coefficient is always being multiplied by the subscript 2. So what is one to do about this? Hmm, interesting, as the plot thickens. The solution is to multiply the formula with the odd number of oxygen atoms by 2. And this is called the least common multiple between 2 and 3. So think... 6. Think 6. So you have 4, 3, and 2, and that's balanced now. Now, 6 oxygen atoms are on the right. Uh, and balance the oxygens on the left by placing a 3 in front of the O2. Then rebalance the aluminum by changing the coefficient of aluminum from 2 to 4. So, a little bit, uh, this is a little bit uh, balancing, is a little bit trial and error. So the only thing I would suggest is to be patient with this. Suppose the equation for the formation of aluminum oxide was written this way. 8 aluminums plus 6 O2 o yields 4 Al2O3. Because this equation obeys the law of conservation of mass, it is correct. However, I would mark it incorrect. Equations are normally written, and that was one of the rules, with coefficients in their lowest possible ratio. 8 to 6 to 4 can all be divided by 2, to 4 to 3 to 2. Each of the coefficients can be divided by 2 to give the previous equation, which has the lowest whole number ratio of coefficients. So be careful when you balance and that you're doing the, least, the lowest ratio. Here's careers in science, and uh, I'm simply essentially showing you, uh, you want to clean up this dump? This is disgusting. Break fluid, antifreeze, um, hazardous waste disposal is, a, uh, is an application, career application for chemistry, uh, organizing. You work for the Environmental Protection Agency or uh, a DEP, which is Department of Environmental Protection at state agencies in the United States. Uh, you're going to be, you know, going to need a lot of background in chemistry. Often charcoal briquettes provide the heat for barbecue grills through the burning of carbon. Have you ever felt the heat and smelled the smoke coming from a burning charcoal grill? The heat and smoke are the products of a combustion reaction. Combustion is one of the five general types of chemical reactions. In this chapter, you will learn that if you can recognize a reaction as being a particular type, 
You may be able to predict the products of the reactants. You may be able to predict the products of the reactants. So now what I'd like to do is let's take a look at uh, the burning of the charcoal briquettes. This is, uh, they're getting ready for a nice barbecue and the uh, ch charcoal briquettes are burning furiously waiting for the hot dogs and hamburgers and uh, I think this is a better picture than, that, than what was in the book. This is uh, another picture that I think is superior than the one, to the one in the book. It clearly shows the reaction of carbon plus oxygen uh, it's not a perfect uh, conversion because you you would have to have blue smoke, blue fire, sorry, uh, and then but you don't have the blue. You have kind of like a dirty fire. It's not a clean uh, combustion. Uh, so you take carbon plus oxygen it yields carbon dioxide. But you can have a few other things in there because it's not a it's not a completely specific just carbon. Uh, and you're producing just carbon dioxide, There's, there are other things being formed there. But other than that, it's a pretty clean reaction. The five general types of reactions are combination, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, and combination. Not all reactions fit uniquely into only one category. Occasionally, a reaction can fit equally well into two categories. Nevertheless, recognizing a reaction as a particular type is useful. Patterns of chemical behavior will become apparent and allow you to predict the products of reactions. Combination reactions. The first type of reaction is the combination or synthesis reaction. A combination reaction is a chemical change in which two or more substances react to form a single new substance. As shown in figure 5, magnesium metal and oxygen gas combine to form a compound magnesium oxide. 2Mg solid plus O2 gas yields 2MgO solid. Notice that in this reaction, as in all combination reactions, the product is a single substance, MgO or magnesium oxide which is a compound. Figure 5, when ignited, magnesium ribbon reacts with oxygen in the surrounding air to form magnesium oxide, a white solid. This is a combination reaction. Observing, observing why do you think this reaction was once used in flash bulbs for photography? Not only in flash bulbs, but they used to have these giant pans uh, above the photographer's head and they simply put a spark charge into this pan of powdered magnesium and it literally lit up the room. That's going back to the 19th century. Mg, 2Mg plus O2 yields 2MgO. This is at the atomic level what's going on. You take this metal and you combine it with a gas and you produce this this crystalline solid where you have this neat arrangement of magnesium atoms and oxygen atoms and the there's the white hot magnesium uh, being burned now why do sparklers why don't they hurt very much when the white light hits you when a little spark hits you uh, here's another shot of a spark of a magnesium ribbon burning why don't why doesn't the the ribbon you know when the sparkler sparks and some of the sparks hit your hand you don't feel uh, you don't feel it it's not very hot yet if that burn if that touched your hand you'd have a severe burn I'm in a waiting room so I have to speak very quietly it's a little weird I know so on the next slide there's even more pictures of magnesium burning in the presence of oxygen what does this white light indicate to you well to me it indicates that a tremendous amount of energy is being given off. So the energy that's in magnesium and oxygen separately, the total energy is much higher than the energy in magnesium oxide solid. So that the energy is being lost because the, 
products are much more stable than the reactants, much more stable than the reactants. Writing equations for combination reaction sample problem four, copper and sulfur shown in the photo, next slide, are the reactants in a combination reaction. Complete the equation for the reaction. Copper solid plus sulfur solid. Two possible reactions. Why are there two possible reactions? The hint is this, that there's two separate oxidation states for copper. On the left is the actual reaction. And on the right, you have in the middle, you have copper metal, you have pellets of copper, you have copper wire, and then you have sulfur. You have big blocks of sulfur. And then you have some sulfur that's a little bit more ground up. Either way, these are the reactants, the copper and the sulfur. What does the grinding up of the copper and the sulfur do to its reactivity? When we talk about chemical reaction, one of the things we have to talk about is the, the surface area available for the reaction to occur in. So you just don't throw a block of copper in with a block of sulfur and expect to get a perfect, complete reaction. What do you need in order for the reaction to happen more effectively and efficiently? You need surface area. Two reactions are possible because copper is a transition metal and has more than one common ionic charge, copper plus one and copper plus two. Determine the formulas for the two products. Balance the two possible <coughs> equations. So in the next slide, we're going to write copper plus sulfur, just like that. Both reactions, copper plus sulfur, copper plus sulfur, Cu plus S, Cu plus S. And then on the other side, you're going to get copper 2 is the top reaction. Cu, S, sulfur is always negative 2. And the copper is plus 2. And then underneath that, you get plus 1 copper and minus 2 sulfur. So you need 2 plus 1s. And then the top equation is balanced as you write it uh, originally with the nomenclature. The bottom one needs to, have, needs to be adjusted, and you do that. The reactants, classifying reactions, the reactants in this combination reaction, magnesium plus oxygen, are two elements. This is often the case, but two compounds may also combine to form a single substance. When a group A metal and non-metal react, the product is a compound consisting of the metal cation and the non-metal anion. 2K solid plus Cl2 gas yields 2KCl solid. So that's going to be potassium plus chlorine gas. Remember, the chlorine gas is diatomic, will yield the two uh, moles or two particles of uh, potassium chloride. Now, potassium chloride can be used also as a salt substitute to sodium chloride. People who have um, sodium restrictive diets oftentimes will use potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride, potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. When two nonmetals react in a combination reaction, more than one product is often possible. For instance, sulfur and oxygen can form sulfur dioxide, or sulfur and oxygen can form sulfur trioxide. The sulfur dioxide, as you remember, will combine with water to form uh, sulfur, sulfurous acid, and sulfur trioxide will combine with water to form sulfuric acid. And so uh, you have the sulfur plus the oxygen. One is sulfur dioxide and the other is sulfur trioxide. And then you simply balance the uh, the, uh, the formula equations. Now those formula equations are actually called stoichiometric equations. The formula equations. So you write the correct formulas relative to the stoichiometry or the nomenclature and then you balance them according to the rules. 
but uh, they are actually a balanced formula equation is actually called a stoichiometric equation. More than one product may also result from the combination reaction of a transition metal and a nonmetal. Here is iron plus sulfur and iron plus sulfur. The top one is going to yield iron 2 sulfide and the bottom will yield iron 3 sulfide. You have to really be told, before you can predict the product, you have to be told what oxidation state the iron will be in. You'll say iron plus sulfur and it's going to be iron 3 or iron 2. Decomposition reactions, when mercury oxide is heated, it decomposes or breaks down into two simpler compounds as shown in figure 6. This says 2HGO yields 2HG liquid plus O2 gas. That's 2HGO solids yields 2HG liquid plus O2 gas. A decomposition reaction is a chemical change in which a single compound breaks down into two or more simpler products. The products can be any combination of elements and compounds. So the top equation, the above the arrow, you could put actually heat or a triangle, which means heat. It is usually difficult to predict the products of decomposition reactions. However, when a simple binary compound such as HGO or mercury 2 oxide breaks down, you know that the products must be the constituent elements mercury and oxygen. Most decomposition reactions require energy in the form of heat, light, or electricity. Figure 6. When orange-colored mercury-2 oxide is heated, it decomposes into its constituent elements, liquid mercury and gaseous oxygen. Comparing and contrasting, how are the reactions pictured in figures 5 and 6 similar? How are they different? Not a very safe reaction, actually, to do in a high school laboratory. We will not be doing the mercury-2 oxide. But where I used to teach years ago in the 80s, it was done quite frequently. So here is the mercury-2 oxide. You see this kind of crystalline structure. And you heat it. See the heat above the yield sign. That's where it belongs. You either put the word H-E-A-T or a triangle. And then you see the mercury metal. It's in a liquid state. And then the oxygen is in the gaseous state. So below is the balanced stoichiometric equation with the triangle above the arrow. Here's another reaction. Mer uh, methane plus oxygen yields uh, CO2 plus water. And, here, and then you balance it by putting a 2 in front of the oxygen and a 2 in front of the water. And the, the methane is there in the form of a hy uh, methyl hydrate, methane hydrate there, and then you have the oxygen gas and then the carbon dioxide. So everything is there, and that's frozen carbon dioxide below, by the way. And then the water, of course. And writing the equation for a decomposition reaction, decomposition reactions that produce gases and heat are sometimes explosive, as the photo shows on the next slide write a balanced equation for the following decomposition reaction. So water is going to be decomposed into, into um, hydrogen and oxygen. So this is a little crazy, but um, this is what the book had shown. And uh, I just took a few better pictures of the implosion. Looks like a nuclear power plant or some kind of power plant cooling tower on the right and some kind of uh, maybe hotel or something like that on the left. And it's just showing you how when you produce a gas, when you, when you, when you decompose the water, you're producing gases. And gases can uh, literally explode buildings. When you explode a bomb or a or a dynamite, the reason it blows up like this is you're, you're rapidly producing gases. When an airbag uh, inflates, you have an explosion, literal explosion, that's producing gases very, very rapidly. Uh, the decomposition of water is not explosive like this, but you are producing gases, and they will literally move mountains. So here's another uh, kind of little bit of an after effect 
of the implosion of a building, what they'll do is they'll put shape charges and time charges in the structural supports of a large building and then they'll explode them uh, in some kind of sequence that's designed by the engineers to bring that building literally down on a dime on a specific spot so that uh, no one's injured in the explosion. Water, a binary compound, breaks down into its elements. We're still on the sample problem five. Balance the equation, remembering that oxygen and hydrogen and oxygen are both diatomic molecules. Remember, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, when they are a gas, they are not monoatomic like the noble gases are. They are diatomic. Hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and nitrogen. Sorry, I didn't say that. And so here's the unbalanced equation. is the skeletal equation. Notice the the catalyst, the electricity, is above the arrow, and you have the liquid water, and you break it down. Now, there's also another catalyst that should be there that's not written in, and a salt, because water doesn't conduct electricity, so you need a salt in there. So you would put, say, sodium nitrate salt, and that would help conduct the electricity through the water, and you would break it down. One of the familiar uh, apparatuses is you would use a Hoffman apparatus, single replacement reaction. Dropping a small piece of potassium into a beaker of water creates a vigorous reaction shown in figure 7. The reaction produces hydrogen gas and a large quantity of heat. The released hydrogen gas can ignite explosively. 2K or potassium plus water yields potassium hydroxide plus a hydrogen gas. Notice the solid, liquid, aqueous, and gas. The alkali metal, figure 7, the alkali metal uh, potassium displaces the hydrogen from the water and produces a solution of potassium hydroxide, which is a base in a single replacement reaction. That's what we just saw. The, re the heat of the reaction is often sufficient to ignite the hydrogen, so it could explode, literally. Inferring, why are alkali metals stored under mineral oil or kerosene? Because that's, that's a very, believe it or not, that's a very dry place. Dry meaning there's no water there. There's no water. You have to find an environment that is waterless, especially sodium. So here's the reaction 2K plus 2HOH yields 2KOH. Sometimes when you write water, it's much more uh, efficient to write it HOH because you can actually see the reaction. You can see how the potassium boots out the hydrogen and if you have two moles of water or two particles of water, you have the your H2 and that they combine covalently. So, and then that's your balanced equation. Writing equations for single replacement reactions. The photo shows the reaction between zinc and sulfuric acid. Notice the solid and the aqueous. Write a balanced chemical equation for each single replacement reactions. The reactions take place in aqueous solution. Now, notice that zinc is going to be reacting and it's going to produce hydrogen gas so the zinc's going to come in, boot out the hydrogen you're going to be left with zinc sulfate and then the other one, the chlorine, is going to come out and boot out the bromine. Bromine's going to be booted out it's going to form Br2, bromine, in the gaseous state. According to the activity series, which you'll see in a second zinc displaces hydrogen from an acid and takes its place. Balance, balance the equation remembering the elemental hydrogen is diatomic. Now you can see that zinc is above hydrogen, so zinc is more reactive because it says decreasing reactivity, so zinc is more reactive than hydrogen and uh, so that's a, that's a good thing, that's why it's going to actually run. Okay, so chlorine is more reactive than bromine and displaces bromine from its from its compound. Balance the equation, bromine is diatomic. Uh, as you go down, fluorine is more reactive than uh, chlorine, chlorine is more reactive than bromine, bromine is more reactive than iodine. The halogens are decreased reactivity as you go down the column. So there are the balanced equations. Remember, the chlorine, bromine, iodine, etc., all the halogens are gases at room temperature, and when they're gases, they are diatomic. Here again is the, is the activity series. Look on the far right. You'll see that the the activity series in order of reactive to least reactive is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. 
and so chlorine will displace the sodium I'm sorry chlorine will displace the bromine and bromine will go into a gas so it's going to be BR2 BR2 so you have Cl2 on the far left and BR2 on the far right similar but less spectacular reactions can occur for example if you drop a piece of zinc into a solution of copper nitrate this reaction occurs this is copper 2 nitrate by the way so it's zinc plus copper 2 nitrate yields copper plus zinc nitrate and I will do this in class by the way and you'll see that zinc is more reactive than copper copper is less reactive than hydrogen so that activity series will help you determine whether or not a reaction is going to actually go uh, these equations describe two examples of a single displacement reaction a single replacement reaction is a chemical reaction in which one element replaces a second element in a compound you can identify a single replacement reaction by noting that both the reactants and the products consist of an element and a compound in the equation above zinc and copper change places the reacting elemental zinc replaces copper in the reactant compound copper to nitrate the products are the element copper and the compound zinc to nitrate we will do that experiment in class when one metal will whether one metal will displace another metal from a compound depends upon the re re relative reactivities of the two metals the activity series of metals given in table two lists metals in order of decreasing reactivity a reactive metal will replace any metal listed below it on the activity series thus iron will displace copper from a copper compound in solution but iron does not similarly display zinc or calcium and here is a better shot for at least 30 seconds of the reactivity series you have the metals on the left of the right um, the right picture and you have the halogens on the right metals from lithium to sodium will replace hydrogen from acids and water from magnesium to lead they will replace hydrogen from acids only okay and there's a simpler activity series on the left that's actually table two a a halogen can replace another halogen from a compound the activity of the halogen decreases as you go down 7a or 17 and uh, of the periodic table fluorine chlorine bromine and iodine bromine is more reactive than iodine so that so this reaction occurs br2 yields nai uh, i'm sorry br2 yield uh, plus sodium iodide yields sodium bromide plus i2 and then br plus nacl no reaction but the bromine is less active than chlorine so this reaction doesn't run double replacement reactions sometimes when two solutions of ionic compounds are mixed nothing happens at other times the ions in the two solutions react figure eight shows that mixing aqueous solutions of potassium carbonate and barium chloride results in a chemical reaction a white precipitate of solid barium carbonate is formed potassium chloride the other product of the reaction remains in solution this is an example of a double replacement reaction which is a chemical change involving an exchange of positive ions between two compounds an exchange of positive and negative ions between two compounds aqueous solutions of potassium carbonate and barium chloride react in a double replacement reaction to form the white precipitate barium carbonate potassium chloride the other product of the reaction remains in solution what drives a double replacement reaction the production of a gas or a precipitate or in in some cases it could be both it could be both here is the reaction of potassium carbonate and barium chloride and you're producing the barium carbonate 
with the uh, potassium chloride and uh, you have the you have the um, uh, the reaction and the barium the barium carbonate is the only one that's not soluble now what you should have is you should have aqueous aqueous solid aqueous in other words the reactants are both aqueous okay now then what happens is the the other the, the one product is going to be a solid that's a precip called a precipitate and the other is going to be a salt that's still dissolved in the water and that's aqueous and then the formation of the precipitate drives the reaction to the right it drives the reaction to the right so the reaction the stress of the reaction is reduced by the formation of the precipitate so the reaction is actually driven in the direction where stress is being relieved from released from the reaction the formation of heat is a release the formation of a precipitate the formation of a gas those are all driving forces in a chemical reaction so I kind of rewound this a little bit and I sh I'm showing you the slide continuing to show you the slide and you have the, the potassium carbonate which is in solution you can see the water molecule surrounding the purple potassium and the uh, kind of grayish carbonate and then in the next beaker another reactant you have the barium green barium surrounded by the water and the chlorine the the, the deep green uh, chlorine the larger one and then you're going to produce yield uh, the single beaker with the uh, potassium, the purple potassium and the green chlorine in solution surrounded by water and then the barium carbonate solid that is a precipitate that is actually driving the reaction. Writing equations for double replacement reactions. Write a balanced chemical equation for each of the double replacement reactions so calcium bromide plus silver nitrate uh, silver is a transition element but it's one of those transition elements that you don't need to put a roman numeral for because there's only one oxidation state for silver you just got to get used to that so calcium bromide aqueous plus silver nitrate aqueous a precipitate of silver bromide is formed that's going to drive that reaction and then iron 2 sulfide plus hydrochloric acid, hydrogen sulfide gas is formed and that's going to drive that reaction. So now you know what, a, what at least one of the products is going to form, so now we just have to re, re, rejuggle the uh, ions. Uh, the driving force behind the reaction is the formation of a precipitate. This is for A, which is shown in the photo. Write correct formulas of the products using ionic charges then balance the equation. B, a gas is formed. Use ionic charges to write the correct formula of the other product. Then balance the equation. Okay, here are the answers. The, for each reaction, write the skeleton equation first, then apply the rules for balancing equations. So, the skeleton equation for the top one is going to be CABR2, aqueous plus AgNO3 aqueous now you're going to exchange calcium and nitrate so then you're going to have calcium nitrate okay and silver bromide so you see the silver bromide is a solid and the calcium nitrate is still in aqueous solution okay then you simply balance it by putting a 2 in front of the silver nitrate and a 2 in front of the silver bromide and you are finished Next, you have the iron to sulfide, and that's going to combine with hydrochloric acid. And the iron to sulfide is in solid form, and the hydrochloric acid is obviously aqueous. And you're going to exchange the ions, and you'll get the uh, iron to and the chlorine, that would be iron to chloride. And that's aqueous, as you can see. And then you'll have the 
hydrogen goes with the sulfur and that will be a gas that's hydrogen sulfide that rotten egg smell hydrogen sulfide and then you simply balance it by putting a two in front of the hydrochloric acid and you're done okay so those are two double replacement reactions and they're balanced again if you have the nitrate or polyatomic ion on both sides of the equation unchanged balance the polyatomic ion not each individual atom double displace double replacement reactions are also referred to as double displacement reactions they generally take place in an aqueous solution and often produce a precipitate a gas or a molecular compound such as water for a double replacement reaction to occur one of the following is usually true one of the following is usually true one <clears throat> One of the products is only slightly soluble and precipitates from solution. For example, the reaction of aqueous solutions of sodium sulfide and cadmium nitrate produce a yellow precipitate of cadmium sulfide. Two, and there's the reaction of sodium sulfide and cadmium nitrate to produce cadmium sulfide and sodium nitrate and then you have one of the products is a gas poisonous hydrogen cyanide gas is produced when aqueous sodium cyanide is mixed with sulfuric acid so you see the NaCN aqueous that's that's two NaCN aqueous that's the sodium cyanide plus the sulfuric acid a AQ that's aqueous and that's going to yield two uh, HCN gas plus sodium sulfate aqueous so now that's balanced so there's a two in front of the sodium cyanide and a two in front of the hydrogen cyanide gas okay uh, and then you have again you have that gas evolving, so that's driving the reaction, that production of that gas. And then you have the sodium and sulfate as spectator ions. Number three, one product is a molecular compound such as water, combining solutions of calcium hydroxide and hyd hydrochloric acid produces water. Calcium hydroxide, CaOH2, plus two HCl aqueous, they're both aqueous, the hydroxide and the acid, produces calcium chloride plus water. Combustion reactions. The flames of a campfire or a gas grill are evidence that a combustion reaction is taking place. A combustion reaction is a chemical change in which an element or compound reacts with oxygen. That's the key, oxygen, often producing energy in the form of heat and light. The products of the combustion reaction are, are low energy, they're very stable. The energy is given off in the form of heat and light. Classifying reactions. A combustion reaction always involves oxygen as a reaction. Often the other reaction is a hydrocarbon, which is a compound composed of hydrogen and carbon. The complete combustion of a Hydrocarbon produces carbon dioxide and water. But if the supply of oxygen is limited during the reaction, the combustion will not be complete. Elemental carbon, soot, and toxic carbon monoxide gas may be additional products, along with a lot of other additional products. The complete combustion of a hydrocarbon releases a huge, says large, huge amount of energy as heat, i.e. a campfire. That's why hydrocarbons such as methane, CH4, propane, C3H8, and butane, C4H10, are important fuels. The combustion reaction for methane is shown in figure 9. Gasoline is a mixture of hydrocarbons that can be approximately represented by the formula CH. 
H18. The complete combustion of gasoline in a car engine is shown in this equation, and that's balanced as it's written. Let's take a look at that equation a little bit more carefully. We have the, the uh, you write the equation. So the only thing that's important really is the hydrocarbon, the formula of hydrocarbon. Think about it. So you have CHH18. All combustion reactions are the same except for the hydrocarbon. So the fact that you have O2 yields CO2 and H2O, liquid. CO2 is gas. So the hydrocarbon, is it a gas or a liquid? And then oxygen, O2, is a gas. Carbon dioxide is a gas. And the water is a liquid. It could be considered a gas too, depending upon the, you know, how the scientist or the chemist wants to write the reaction. But it's generally considered, either way, uh, gas, liquid, etc. So, um, so then you put the hydrocarbon in, and then you balance it. And um, we will work on balancing hydrocarbons. It's a little bit of a trick, but um, you balance the oxygen last. Uh, you try to balance the carbon first, and then the hydrogen, and then the oxygen uh, last. So here you have, uh, the, look at the ratio, 2 to 25 to 16 to 18. That's lowest ratio. So what I would do is I would say, okay, let's do the let's do the carbon first. So you have eight of them, so you put in an eight in front of the C, and you wind up, you know, you wind up um, uh, going back and forth between the hydrogen and the carbon, and finally with the O2. But we'll practice that in class. Methane gas reacts with oxygen from the surrounding air in a combustion reaction to produce carbon dioxide and water. Inferring, what else is produced in this reaction? Methane gas reacts with oxygen from the surrounding air in the combustion reaction to produce carbon dioxide and water. Well, if it's an incomplete reaction, you're going to be forming a very deadly gas, and that's carbon monoxide. Researchers there are studying sediment cores containing methane hydrates, icy, struck, con icy constructs of water molecules with the explosive methane, gas methane, trapped within. And this is one of those hydrates that's burning, and it's a source of fuel. And it's found in the deep oceans. Uh, they first, I don't know if they first, but they, they saw a lot of it in the, when they had the Gulf the BP Gulf disaster. As the Maryland General Assembly debates whether to impose a moratorium on hydraulic fracking to extract natural gas, a new study adds fuel to the already explosive debate over the climate impact of fracking. Researchers with the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, estimate that between 4% and 9% of the natural gas can leak into the atmosphere during extraction. These leaks could, could reduce or eliminate the fuel's advantage over coal as a clean fuel from a climate perspective. And here's an example of the methane gas being burned off uh, that is coming out of the ground, etc. So either way, you're going to be producing greenhouse gases, either by converting the methane to natural gas, uh, to carbon dioxide or other hydrocarbons. Gas hydrates are widespread around the world and are usually found in continental margin sediments. Because they contain methane, the world's gas hydrate deposits represent a significant source of hydrocarbons, not least because many of them are underlain by potentially vast natural gas methane deposits. Recent estimates indicate that together the gas hydrate and underlying free gas reservoirs comprise almost half of the Earth's organic carbon. For this reason, gas hydrates may represent a future source of fuel uh, if an efficient and safe method of extracting them can be developed. And there's a picture of them in the sediments, etc. 
The reactions <coughs> between oxygen and some elements other than carbon are also examples of combustion reactions. For example, both magnesium and sulfur will burn in the presence of oxygen. As you look at these combustion equations, notice that the reactions could also be classified as combination reactions. Magnesium plus oxygen yields magnesium oxide. It's a combustion reaction. It's also a synthesis reaction or a combination reaction, however you want to look at it. And then there's also sulfur plus oxygen yields sulfur dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And uh, it, it also makes acid rain. As you remember, mixed with water, it's sulfurous acid. What are the products of the combustion of a hydrocarbon? Carbon dioxide and water. Similar to the combustion reaction because of the oxygen. Now that you've learned about some of the basic reaction types, you can predict the products of many reactions. The number of elements <coughs> and or compounds reacting is a good indicator of possible reaction type and thus possible products. For example, in a combination reaction, two or more reactants, elements, or compounds combine to form a single product. In a decomposition reaction, a simple compound is the reactant. Two or more substances are the product. Magnesium metal <coughs> is an important component of alloys used to make consumer materials. The main commercial source of magnesium is seawater. The magnesium plus two ion is the third most abundant dissolved ion in the oceans. A process for isolating magnesium from seawater depends on the fact that because of the double replacement reaction, magnesium plus two will precipitate when OH is added. Students can research the commercial process on how do you get magnesium from seawater. Predicting the products of a chemical reaction. An element and a compound are the reactants in a single replacement reaction. A different element and a new compound are the products. In a double replacement reaction, two ionic compounds are the reactants. Two new compounds are the products. The reactants in a combustion reaction are oxygen and usually a hydrocarbon, but not necessarily. The products of, the most, uh, the products of most combustion reactions are carbon dioxide and water. Writing an equation for a combustion reaction. Okay, an alcohol lamp often uses ethanol as a fuel. Pictures on the next slide. Write <coughs> balanced equations for the complete combustion of these. Benzene and ethanol. Okay, so we're going to look at alcohol lamps for a moment. And you're going to see how they, they actually do a pretty good job. Uh, although it would be annoying to keep filling the alcohol container, but they, they do a pretty good job pretty bright and uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to take that alcohol and also the benzene and I'm going to combine it with what? Well, the whole concept of combustion is that it combines with oxygen. Now, if it's a hydrocarbon, it's going to be carbon dioxide and water. If it's like magnesium or sulfur, it's going to be a more like a synthesis reaction. So oxygen is the other reactant in the combustion. The products are carbon dioxide and water, as I said. Write the skeleton equation for each reaction, then balance the equation. So you're simply going to write the skeleton equation. You're going to write the members in, and that's pretty easy to do for a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions are among the easiest to write the equation for. So it's going to be benzene plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water, and ethanol plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. You want to write the formulas down. Write the names first, and then write the formulas. And there's the formulas, and there they are balanced. I kind of did everything all together. And C6H6 is benzene. O2, you look up the, you look up on your computer the formula for benzene. And then plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. And then you balance them. And balance the oxygen last. Do it in terms of, if you have to do it oxygen in terms of seven and a half, that's fine. So it'd be one, seven and a half, six, and six and three. And then simply double everything to get rid of that fraction. And then the next one, the methanol, the ethanol, you're just putting the two, the three in front of the oxygen, the two in front of the carbon dioxide, and three in front of the water. And again, look at this one. This is the water is gaseous. 
So it's a little difficult to predict, to predict what the water's going to be, but if you put gaseous for them, I wouldn't care. The liquid is important for the hydrocarbon. Ethanol is a liquid room temperature, and so is benzene, barely. Figure 10, the five types of chemical reactions discussed in this chapter are summarized here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to see a summary of the chemical reactions that we've been studying in this chapter. There are five types of chemical reactions. There's single replacement, double replacement, synthesis or combination, decomposition, and combustion. So those are the d different types of reactions, and what we'll do is we, re we will review them here. The first one is a, com a combustion react or combination reaction. It, this could also be a combustion reaction because of the oxygen. And in a combustion, in a combination reaction, you take two metals or two or a metal and a nonmetal. I'm sorry, a metal or a nonmetal, a metal and a nonmetal, two elements, and you produce a compound. You could also take two other substances like sulfur dioxide plus water yields sulfurous acid. So an acid and hydride becomes uh, an acid. And here's the general equation and a little bit about the, the reactants products and then a little bit of an example. Okay, so that's going to be the combination reaction, which generally tends to be straightforward. It's not a big deal. Uh, when you have an acid, like the, the hydration of an acid, you just simply have to know what polyatomic ion it becomes. SO2 becomes SO3 negative 2 charge. Next is a decomposition reaction. When I take mercury to oxide and heat, I produce mercury plus oxygen, mercury metal plus the oxygen, and that's a decomposition reaction. <clears throat> By rights, I should have a tri at least a triangle over the yield sign, or I could simply put heat. Yields mean, yield can mean heat uh, as, a, uh, as a message to the reader relative to the chemistry. Uh, and here's the general equation, the reactants, probable products, example, and a picture of what it looks like when you actually heat it. All you're doing is heating it. And then the mercury falls to the bottom and the gas rises to the top and leaves the container. Okay, let's continue. Here's a single replacement reaction. Here's a, an example. Two potassium plus two waters yields potassium hydroxide. Two potassium hydroxide plus hydrogen. Notice the states they're in. Solid potassium, liquid water, aqueous, potassium hydroxide, and hydrogen in the gaseous phase. Potassium hydroxide is very corrosive. It can hurt you. It can burn you. It's something to be careful of. Hydrogen is also combustible in air because of the oxygen. Here's the general equation for the single displacement reaction. See the T comes in and displaces the R. And you can read about the reactants. You can read about the possible products. And the example is potassium in water. Single replacement is a very important uh, type of reaction when exploring the electromotive force tables or the reactivity of metals table where you're determining whether or not a reaction can run depending upon which is most reactive. The element that is, if the element that is single, the singlet element, if that's more reactive than the element combined to the nonmetal, then it's going to react, otherwise it will not. Here's a double replacement reaction. Uh, what you could do is, a book used to do this, they'd say, all right, you have you have potassium carbonate, right? So you have two ions, a positive and a negative, and then barium chloride, positive and negative. So, and I think we've seen, we've seen this before. You see, you have aqueous, aqueous, aqueous precipitate. Very good. So you'd say A, B, so potassium is A, then carbonate is B, plus C, D yields A, D, plus C, B. So you see how they kind of, kind of exchange. We used to call it a, B plus C, D yields A, D plus C, B. Either way. And there are the specifics to review for the double replacement reaction. Uh, so you can read that and follow along. Okay. 
Here is a combustion reaction. You have a hydrocarbon plus oxygen, yields carbon dioxide and water. There are some uh, either vessels that hold the gases or examples of the gases below. So, the, in a combustion reaction, if it's a hydrocarbon, the products are going to be carbon dioxide and water. All combustion reactions will have oxygen as the second reactant. Pretty straightforward. And there is the, there is the example. The methane gas burner, the natural gas burner, it's mostly methane. It can also be ethane as opposed to uh, LPG, liquid, liquid, liquid petroleum gas, which is mostly the heavier gases, propane, butane, uh, pentane, uh, more dangerous to use, uh, more energetic. Technology and Society Combating Combustion. A fire has three requirements. Oxygen, fuel, and a temperature high enough to initiate and sustain combustion. Firefighters put out fires by eliminating one or more of these requirements. When water is sprayed on a typical building fire, it stops the fire from lowering the temperature of the burning material and soaking it with non-combustible water. Steam from the vaporizing water also tend to displace the air from around the fuel, which denies oxygen to the fuel. The fuel is the second reactant. When they're saying the fuel, it's oxygen plus the fuel. The fuel could be wood, paper, whatever the case is, whatever's in the building that can burn. So when they say fuel, they mean the second reactant. They give you oxygen there. That's a given. To improve the ability of water to saturate the fuel, for example, upholstered furniture and rugs, a substance called a surfactant is added to the water. Inferring, how can it help to roll on the ground if your clothes are on fire? Because you're, you're essentially denying the oxygen from getting to the fuel, which is your body and the clothes that you're wearing. Here are some pictures of horrific fires uh, and the people fighting them they are uh, it's really quite amazing I will I will show you how the vaporization of the water the vaporization of the water not only it will help uh, put out the fire not only does water smother the fuel and prevent the oxygen from combining with it but it also just the production of the of the, uh, of, the, of the steam will help. Water is the most important tool for firefighters. Water-based foams are more, more effective, but they are also more expensive. The foams are very expensive. The foams are going to be used for uh, chemical fires that have to be put out very, very quickly. Uh, so they're going to, you know, it's going to be worth the cost. You know, you really don't want a a chemical fire burning for any length of time, but they are very expensive. Fire extinguishers indicate on their label what types of fires they are designed to extinguish. Some extinguishers might be labeled AB, for example, indicating that they are effective on more than one type of fire. Many fire extinguishers now are labeled with pictures that show the type of fire. For example, a type A extinguisher might show a picture of burning wood. The extinguisher might also show what type of fire the extinguisher should not be used on by showing a picture of what type of fire in a circle with a black line through it. When I uh, rented my plate, my house in the United States, I had to make sure there was a, there was a type A extinguisher in the kitchen. That was uh, township law. Electrical fires, chemicals such as monoammonium phosphate, MAP, blown from a dry chemical extinguisher, cover an electrical fire and cut off the oxygen, su oxygen supply from the uh, fuel, from the fuel. So you can have electrical fires, you can have them, gosh, you can have them inside the wall of your house and you don't even know it. So sometimes they have to kind of break the break the walls in just to get rid of the there's 
to get rid of the uh, fire within the walls that you can't see. And by the time you do see it, uh, you might not be able to get out of the house and save your life. So, electrical fires are very dangerous. I worked with firefighters quite a bit when I was an uh, EMT, and it is a horrific, horrific job. Uh, exhausting. Un Let's talk about some fo uh, forest fires. Uh, firefighters combat uh, forest fires from the air by spreading substances that coat the surface of the trees to prevent burning. They can also cut the fire off from its fuel by using bulldozers to clear a uh, path through the trees or by setting a controlled blaze. Uh, Mr. Nair worked for the fire service in the United States uh, for a while and uh, it is exhausting. He had some great stories when he worked for the fire service. That could be Mr. Nair right there working for the Federal Fire Service. You can see that they're putting out the brush fires uh, that are going to reignite tall standing trees so it spreads when it said when the expression it spreads like a wildfire well that's what he's trying to do that gentleman there is trying to reduce the amount of spread you can see the helicopter above dumping chemical material on the fire there's a helicopter that's a good shot of one California's hot weather and dry conditions triggered two big fires in bone Bone dry state on Sunday evening, which continued to consume wild land and brush area near Los Angeles and San Francisco on Monday morning. North of Los Angeles, firefighters have worked swiftly to contain to gain ground against a brush fire raging in in Ang Angeles National Forest. Unbelievable. Fire crews have tried to improve their grip on the blaze as gusty winds are expected to storm through the area at 60 miles per hour in the next 24 hours. According to warnings issued by the National Weather Service, the wildland fires are already consumed more than 2,000 acres. More than 1,000 people were driven from their homes. As of Monday noon, the brush fire was only 20% contained. Here's a really good shot of uh, the chemical, the chemicals being dumped on a fire by a plane, uh, and it Again, it prevents the the, uh, the wood from burning. It's an anti-burning chemical, and uh, it will separate the fire from its fuel. So uh, and the fire gets very cranky, so you don't want to separate it from its fuel. Plus, burns are extremely painful. My goodness. Now we're going to look at grease fires. Uh, if you put water, water sprayed on a grease fire can spread the flames because the grease goes on top of the water. Usually like with wood, when wood's burning, you put the water on the wood, the wood's nailed down, so the water goes on the wood, as opposed to grease fire where the grease goes on, stays on top of the water. A carbon dioxide fire extinguisher produces a cloud of heavier than, heavier than CO2, heavier than air, produces heavier than air CO2 uh, that blankets the fire and cuts off the oxygen supply. So you gotta deny, you gotta take that combustion reaction and either take the fuel out or take the oxygen out. You gotta get rid of something. Here are some uh, horrific pan fires. If, you ever, if you've ever cooked bacon and you had the heat up too high, uh, the grease will vaporize and uh, that vapor can catch on fire. And it is, it can be uh, scary, horrific, uh, when the whole big cloud of chicken uh, bacon grease gets on fire. It's uh, quite unbelievable. Or wax of some sort if you're melting wax. Here's another uh, shot of a stove with a grease fire on top of it that's about to be put out. Looks like almost like a training, part of a training film for firefighters. Looks like an old, old wall and with a stove in front of it. It's like a pretty inexpensive stove and uh, the pot. I'm not quite sure how you get a grease fire from a big soup pot, but it uh, looks like it's all set up at a, some kind of fire training institute. The beauty of a limestone cavern is the result of a chemical reaction involving water. Limestone caverns form as calcium carbonate reacts with carbon dioxide dissolved in water. 
and it forms soluble calcium hydrogen carbonate. Additionally, carbon dioxide then converts the calcium hydrogen carbonate back into calcium carbonate. The calcium carbonate precipitates and forms dramatic stalact stalactites and stalagmites. In this section, you will learn to predict the formation of precipitates and write equations to describe reactions that produce them using essentially solubility rules. So using the solubility rules, you'll be able to determine whether or not something is going to precipitate. Here is a limestone cave. You can see the stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, which, which is which? A little extra credit. Tell me which is which. First one to do so. Which one is the stalagmite and which one is the stalactite? One hangs and one comes up from the floor. Uh, so which one is a stalactite and which one is a stalagmite? Okay, let's look at another picture. Here are some very dramatic uh, calcium carbonate hangings. And you can see that this cave has been pretty much undisturbed for many, many years because you have uh, fairly pristine looking uh, stalagmites or stalactites, you have to tell me which is which, so I don't really know yet. I'm going to let you tell me, and uh, we'll see what happens. And here, are, here is the Carlsbad Caverns. I think Carlsbad Caverns is in Virginia, in the Shenandoah, by the Shenandoah Mountains, if I recall correctly. Beautiful area in the Appalachian Mountain chain. It's a part of the Appalachians. Uh, it's in northern Virginia. Uh, a lot of, lot of great history. Very, 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 very beautiful area. Uh, gorgeous. Your world is water-based. More than 70% of Earth's surface is covered by water. And about 66% of the adult human body is water. It is not surprising, then, that many important chemical reactions take place in water, that is, in aqueous solution. The reaction of aqueous solutions of silver nitrate with sodium chloride to form solid silver chloride and aqueous sodium nitrate in a double replacement reaction. The reaction is shown in Figure 11. Here is a... a a copy of the stoichiometric reaction. It reads simply AgNO3 aqueous plus NaCl aqueous yields AgCl solid, that's the precipitate, plus NaNO3 aqueous. Silver nitrate plus sodium chloride yields silver chloride plus sodium nitrate. And that's the reaction. It's a very standard reaction in studying chemistry. We, we will do that as a lab in class. Very standard. Figure 11. A precipitate of silver chloride forms when aqueous solutions of silver nitrate and sodium chloride are mixed, inferring. Which ions do not participate in the reaction? Well, the silver chloride is what precipitates, everything else is still there. So just look at the reaction and say, well, if I write everything in ions and cross out the ions that, that, don't, that don't react, then those are the, or I cross out the ions that do react, what's left over are the spectator ions. Silver chloride precipitates at the bottom of the vessel. So you can see the silver precipitate, silver one, precip uh, silver one chloride or just silver chloride, precipitate at the bottom of that vessel. And you can see that it's a fairly cloudy solution and it will take a while to completely settle. This is the way you have been writing equations involving aqueous solutions of ionic compounds. However, the equation does not show that most, that like most ionic compounds, the reactants and one of the products dissociate or separate into cations and anions when they dissolve in water. It separates into sodium ions 
Na plus 1 aqueous, and chlorine ion Cl negative 1. Similarly, silver nitrate dissociates into silver ions, Ag plus 1 aqueous, and nitrate ions, NO3 negative 1 aqueous. So you've got to, you've got to eventually come up with a way of getting rid of these spectator ions, and, and this is going to be the way uh, we're going to do it. Let's look at the next slide and see how we're going to write everything in ions and then cancel out the ions that are not reacting and actually part of the chemical equation. You can use these ions to write a complete ionic equation, an equation that shows dissolved ionic compounds as dissociated free ions. Here are the ions that are involved in the former equation on the last couple of slides. You have Ag plus 1 aqueous plus NO3 negative 1 aqueous plus Na plus 1 aqueous plus Cl minus 1 aqueous. Now on the product side you have AgCl solid so that's not ionic that's a solid it's not dissolved plus Na plus 1 aqueous plus NaO3 negative 1 aqueous. So notice that the nitrate ion and the sodium ion appear unchanged on both sides of the equation. So now what we'll do is we will cancel the ions if they exist on both sides. So you can see that the nitrate and sodium will cancel because they are on both sides of the equation. And what's left are simply the ions and the precipitate that are part of a change, a chemical change. So the sodium, the, sorry, the, uh, the silver plus one ion aqueous and the chloride ion aqueous bond together to form silver chloride. So that bonding and the changing from aqueous to solid in terms of precipitation are going to be the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation is an equation for a reaction in solution that shows only those particles that are directly involved in the chemical change. Silver, Ag plus 1, aqueous plus Cl minus 1, chloride, aqueous, yield silver chloride. In writing balanced net ionic equations, you must make sure that the ionic charge is balanced. For the previous reaction, the net ionic charge on each side of the equation is zero and is therefore balanced. But if you need two chloride ions, because it's AgCl2 for instance, you would need to put a 2 in front of the Cl. But consider the skeleton equation for the reaction of lead with silver nitrate, PBS, sorry, PBS solid, plus AgNO3 aqueous yields Ag solid plus lead 2 nitrate, PBNO3 2 aqueous. The nitrate ion is the spectator ion in this reaction. The net ionic equation is this. Pb solid plus Ag plus 1 Aq yields Ag solid plus Pb plus 2 aqueous. Now that's unbalanced. However, it doesn't have to be a double replacement reaction to have to be written as a net ionic equation. You see that in the problem, the, the negative ion, the nitrate, is the only one that's not undergoing a chemical change. So that can be deleted. This is a kind of reaction called a redox reaction that we'll study in electrochemistry. Redox means reduction oxidation. Reduction is when something gains electrons. Oxidation is when something loses electrons. 
So Pb is losing electrons to become positively charged, and silver is gaining electrons because it's becoming zero charged. Remember, the atom is a zero charge. So the reduction is going to be silver, and the oxidation is going to be lead, thereby oxidation reduction, or reduction oxidation, and redox reaction. Redox reaction. Now, at the bottom of the slide, it says, a net ionic equation shows only those particles involved in the reaction and is balanced with respect to both mass and charge. Now, the, the value that we're going to look at is going to be, well, how many electrons were gained? How many electrons were lost by the individual ions? Let's look at this slide again. So do you see that the lead is losing two electrons? It's attaining a plus two charge. Well, that means there's two electrons floating around out there. Everything has to be accounted for. You can't give up two electrons, that is from the lead, and then only gain one electron from silver and only have one silver become reduced or become an atom, so you have to balance the electrons. So you have to put a two in front of the silver because there's two electrons available. So two silvers will be reduced with the one lead that's oxidized. Sample problem nine, writing and balancing net ionic equation. So this is going to be an application of what we just did. In the photograph, aqueous solutions of iron three chloride and potassium hydroxide are mixed a precipitate of iron 3 hydroxide forms. Identify the spectator ions and write a balanced net ionic equation for the reaction. We have to write a net, a balanced net ionic equation. So, let's analyze this. Write the complete ionic equation for the reaction, showing any soluble ionic compounds as individual ions. Eliminate aqueous ions that appear as both reactants and products. Balance the net ionic equation. So here's the reaction. I kind of did everything at once. The iron plus three aqueous plus three chloride aqueous, because remember it's going to be FeCl3, plus three potassium plus one, and three hydroxide minus one, and that's going to yield the iron three hydroxide plus the three potassium plus ones and the three chloride ions. So the spectator ions, potassium plus one and chlorine negative one, the balanced net ion equation is Fe plus three aqueous plus three OHs negative aqueous yields Fe O with a three. Solid. Now, this is the deal. When you write this ionic business, I would write the, let me take a side thing here. Do You see on the right table it says OH. All hydroxides are insoluble except for sodium and potassium. Hydroxides of barium and calcium are slightly soluble. So that's from the alkali metals and the alkali earth metals. Only a few of them are so soluble. So the transition hydroxides are definitely insoluble. So <clears throat> I would write a complete balanced stoichiometric equation. It's going to be easier to balance the electrons. It's just easier. So do the stoichiometric equation and then break things down to the ions and use the coefficients from the balancing to, to distribute that throughout the ions. For instance, if I had if I had uh, sodium hydroxide and there was three of them, then I would put three sodium, three hydroxide. And then just do an electron count to double check. You have seen that mixing solutions of two ionic compounds can sometimes result in the formation of insoluble salt called a precipitate. Some combinations of solutions produce precipitates while others do not. Whether or not a precipitate forms depends upon the solubility of the new compounds that form. Remember, the formation of a precipitate drives the reaction. Predicting the formation of a precipitate. 
you can predict the formation of a precipitate by using the general rules for solubility, which we've already used, of ionic compounds. These rules are shown in Table 3 on the next slide. Will a precipitate form when aqueous solutions of sodium carbonate and barium nitrate are mixed? So you want to check. So here's sodium plus the carbonate plus the barium plus the nitrate in all in aqueous form and then we want to write the equations for those the reactants, the formula reactants and write the balanced equation it says when these four ions are mixed the cations could change partners if they did the two new compounds that would form would be sodium nitrate and barium carbonate so here is the here is the table three and I will just leave this on for a minute and approximately 56, 55 seconds, and you can examine this table, and I'll just be quiet. I'll go over to the side, and you can check to see whether or not. I'll just give you a hint. There was a problem that we did earlier in this movie that involved one of the chemicals that have to do with this problem. Okay, let's look at some of these things. It says all carbonates and phosphates are insoluble except those of sodium, potassium, and ammonium. That's very interesting. It says carbonates, phosphates, chromates, sulfides, and hydroxides are insoluble. Okay, these are the only new combinations of cations and anions possible. To find out if these exchanges will occur, refer to Table 3 which gives guidelines for determining whether, whether ion combinations are insoluble. Recall that sodium is an alkali metal. Rows 1 and 2 tell you that sodium nitrate will not form a precipitate because alkali metal salts and nitrate salts are soluble. And we can double check that. It says nitrate up top. All nitrates are soluble. So sodium nitrate is not going to form a precipitate. It will stay in the ion form and be spectator ions. So the only other combination that might create uh, a possible precipitate would be what? Just to be clear about something, it says table three on the left table. Uh, that's the table from the book. So when the text is referring to a table and a row, they're referring to that table. And the carbonates, for instance, are one, two, three, four, the fifth row down. So, and it says carbonates are most, most carbonates are insoluble. So, the other table, I think, is easier to read, but who knows, uh, to each their own. But both tables are the same. They're organized a little differently. However, when the book refers to a table, it's the table on the left, not the table on the right. The table that's labeled, tabled, Table 3. Okay, predicting the formation of a precipitate continued. Row 5, remember on the left table, indicates that carbonates in general are insoluble. Barium carbonate will precipitate. In this reaction, sodium plus 1 and nitrate minus 1 are spectator ions. The net ionic equation for this reaction is as follows. Barium plus 2 aqueous plus carbonate minus 2 aqueous yields barium carbonate solid. Now, the barium and the carbonate are going to exchange two electrons. So the carbonate's giving up two and the barium needs two. So the barium is plus 2, the carbonate is minus 2. So they're going to give up those electrons, and the barium will gain 2 and, the, and, be, and be reduced, and the carbonate will lose 2 and become oxidized. And that concludes the lesson, the lecture, for Chapter 11, Chemical Reactions, or affectionately known as equation writing, or
predicting products and writing complete balanced formula equation. Remember, a complete balanced formula equation is called a stoichiometric equation.